Uh, so everyone, welcome back uh, for the second part of uh, our peer presentations. I just want to welcome you to this presentation uh, brought to you by the Collaborative Mentorship Network for Chronic Pain and Addiction, as well as the Alberta College of Family Physicians. And uh, we're excited to have uh, Drs. Tina Koronik and Jessica Kirkwood presenting Taming the Burn, Evidence for the Management of Neuropathic Pain. And uh, next slide. Before we get started, I do wanna do a, a land acknowledgement. And we would like to recognize that we're webcasting from and to many different parts of Alberta today. The province of Alberta is located on Treaty 6, Treaty 7, and Treaty 8 territory and is the traditional meeting ground and home for many Indigenous peoples. And so before we get started, I'm going to do my disclosure. So I am Dr. Kathy Scrimshaw. I am the medical lead for the Collaborative Mentorship Network for Chronic Pain and Addiction. And I am a part-time employee of the Alberta College of Family Physicians. I have no other declarations or conflicts. Um, the program is uh, supported by the Alberta College of Physicians through a Health Canada Substance Use and Addictions Program contribution. It does not receive in-kind support. And just some housekeeping uh, mentions today. Uh, to capture your attendance, you have to click on a survey link in the chat log to enter your name and email. Uh, we're going to be using the question and answer log to collect questions, and there's an upvote feature, so the most popular questions are, are noted and will get asked first. Um, so just use the chat log if you're commenting, but if you have a question, if you can put it in the Q&A, that would be great. And we have an evaluation survey link that's going to be posted in the chat log near the, uh, the end of the session. Really value your evaluations. We take them very seriously. So please try to fill it out and then uh, give us some suggestions and topics that you might want to uh, explore further. So thank you. Now we do have a poll uh, that we've just put up. Uh, we just would like to know what profession you are. And if you can fill that out, it'll be up for about 30 seconds. And so the results should be up on your screen. It looks like 72% uh, are family docs, so 13% are pharmacists. We've got 2% specialists and one nurse practitioner, 2%, uh, one nurse, um, one mental health professional and others. So uh, thanks a lot for putting that in. Our, our speakers really like to know who they're talking to. So. And then if you can fill in your zone. So it looks like, yeah, we our, our cities, it looks like uh, Calgary and Edmonton, uh, as usual, have the biggest attendance. And then uh, the rest of the zones, thanks so much. That's super helpful as we do our planning and uh, get started on the webinar. So with no further ado, we're gonna uh, get our speakers, Jessica and Tina to start and I will mute. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, Jessica's gonna share the screen here and we're gonna get started. So we're super excited to be here. Thanks everyone for showing up uh, on a beautiful, somewhat beautiful Tuesday evening. Today, we're gonna talk about taming the burn. Um, so evidence for the management of neuropathic pain. Last week, we talked a little bit about evidence for low back pain. So um, this is kind of exciting. This is uh, soon to be published data, but hasn't yet been published. So. Um, they're some of the first folks we're running through it with. So I'll start with uh, myself. My name is uh, Tina Kronick. I'm a family physician and I work at the Northeast Community Health Center. I also work at the University of Alberta uh, with the peer team. I've received some funding from the Alberta College of Family Physicians and other provincial colleges, but no money from industry. Um, our, one of the goals of our team is to minimize financial conflicts of interest so we can just present the evidence uh, potentially without any biases. So um, I'm also a member of the Canadian Task Force and I do a little bit of work with them with regards to their preventative uh, guidelines. All right, Jess. Awesome. Thanks, Tina. Um, 
Am I not muted? Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> my name's Jessica Kirkwood. I'm a family doc uh, here in Edmonton as well. Shout out to the other, probably my mom. Just kidding. There's a Blue Jays game on, so my mom's definitely not tuning in for this. Uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, yeah, I'm a family doc here in Edmonton. Uh, my clinical work is centered in a place called the Bowen Macaulay Health Center and mostly focuses on treating patients with substance use disorders um, as well as people struggling with homelessness. Uh, and then my academic work, I have joined the peer team in September 2019, which was really exciting for me um, and has been awesome. Um, and so in order to do that, I, I wasn't in big pharma's pocket um, by any stretch, but I have uh, gotten some speakers honoraria through the Alberta College of Family Physicians, and I've done a little bit of consulting work with the medical panel's office, but no money otherwise. So yeah, really excited to be back again today. Thanks for joining us. All right. So what are we going to do for the next hour? We're going to talk about the best evidence around the management of chronic neuropathic pain. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the limitations of that evidence and uh, then we'll talk about some of the tools that we are we have developed and are working to develop um, for shared informed decision making in the management of chronic pain. So just a bit of a history. Some of you who joined us last week will know um, that we originally got funding actually to look in the context of the opioid uh, crisis. And so we received money as a group to look at that and we developed guidelines. But one of the pieces of that was if we're saying maybe we should really take a good look at are we using opioids appropriately in chronic pain management and how is the best way to manage chronic pain. So the next piece was looking at that. So we've, we've uh, done a systematic review looking at the evidence around osteoarthritis, low back pain, and most recently neuropathic pain. And that's the one that will be published in the Canadian Family Physician in mid-May. Um, so it's done and submitted. It's just uh, I was Googling something for the presentation. And I forgot. Oh, yeah, it's not actually published yet. So I um, had to use my own files. So we, we've looked at a lot of RCTs. Um, our team has reviewed almost 1,500 RCTs, randomized control trials in total uh, as we've gone through this. Um, and we've extracted data from a large number of those. So the ultimate goal of all of this is um, to put this all together to develop a pain a guideline. Um, and we have a, a committee of members from across the country actually who meet regularly to review this. Um, and uh, we've identified additional questions that we're now looking into. All right, so for this particular systematic review, that for this uh, question that we asked, so what we were looking for is, is the best quality evidence we could find looking at adults who had chronic, so at least three months duration pain. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we really just looked at three primary uh, conditions. So diabetic neuropathy, post herpetic neuralgia, and trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, and there's certainly a ton of other conditions we could have looked at. But uh, as you can see, each of these was a, was a ton of work and, and they were identified um, by a committee that thought that these were things that would be seen and, uh, and expected to be dealt with in a primary care setting. So interventions that we looked at were exercise, acupuncture, SNRIs, TCAs, some topical interventions, opioids, and anticonvulsants. And we excluded trials that looked at pregnant patients uh, where the pain was just an acute um, issue uh, and uh, also other specific conditions. So if it was HIV neuropathy or post-surgical, um, those ones we didn't we didn't look at. Yeah, and so um, just like we wanted our population that we looked at to mirror uh, a typical family practice or, or primary care population, we also wanted to make sure that our outcomes were ones that mattered. And if you're familiar with peers' work, um, you know that we're really focused on patient-oriented outcomes. We don't like focusing on um, things like lab values or um, things that aren't really gonna matter to our patients. And so um, there's different ways to look at pain and, and well, and just um, research in general. And so you could look for continuous outcomes and typically those are measurements on a numeric scale, something like a visual analog scale, like you can see on the coffee mug. There's lots of funny ones to choose from. I really enjoyed finding that. That wasn't even the best one. Um, <laughs> Um, but sometimes something like a continuous outcome can be difficult to summarize. So often what you're dealing with is something called the standardized mean, mean difference, which is kind of smushing different scales together. And at the end of the day, you can be asking yourself, what does this really mean? And what, what does this mean for my patients or the patients that were in the trials? Um, also, we really wanted to look at um, if something was uh, found to be statistically significant, was it clinically significant? Because again, just comes down to what we're gonna see in practice. 
so um, there's also responder or dichotomous outcomes, and that's like a yes or no response. And so that could be um, a serious endpoint like an MI or something in other trials. But what we looked at was how many people got better, who responded to this treatment, because um, what we'd like to say at the end is we have an idea of about how many people will improve with the treatment. And typically that improvement is, is about a 30% improvement. It can vary by study. And the, the other caveat with that is that not all trials provided these responder outcomes. So it was a little bit of a limitation in terms of what we were looking for. Um, so ultimately, as I say, we did look for responder outcomes. We focused on meaningful pain relief. And a question we often get asked is why did we choose pain instead of function? And again, sorry if this is repetition if you were here last week, but it's a good thing to start on just to remind ourselves. Um, we are absolutely um, in agreement that chronic pain management really focuses on function and we want to talk with our patients about how their lives are improved and what they can do um, with whatever interventions they may choose. But um, pain is often the reason that patients present to uh, see us. And so that's a really important thing. And also a large amount of the evidence focuses on pain and things like function may be a secondary outcome. And if we thought pain was difficult to interpret from different scales, function takes it even a step further. Um, and so ultimately we looked for this meaningful pain relief, which generally refers to a 30% or more reduction in pain, though uh, that can be different. And so there were some trials that focused on a 50% reduction, for example, um, and it can also refer to achieve, uh, achieving a certain threshold on a scale. So uh, just an example would be if someone was a six out of 10 on a pain scale, about a 30% reduction would bring them down to a four. And so, yeah, after months of research, this poor puppy just found out that he can't read. But luckily, we found a bit more. And so we're excited to share that with you tonight. And we're going to start off with the big bursa, which was anticonvulsants. This was a huge part of our systematic review. And the four medications that we found evidence on or evidence for were gabapentin, pregabalin, oxcarbazepine, and topiramate. And we broke those down and uh, meta did a meta-analysis on each of those individually. But overall, for anticonvulsants, we found 40 randomized control trials, well, about 9,500 patients. And the span of the trials were anywhere from two, womp womp, to 16 weeks, which is not really that long either. Obviously, and we talked about it a bit last week too, is we'd love to see trials that follow patients for longer because this is chronic pain. And as I said last week, unless I'm the only doctor in Alberta that's not curing my chronic pain patients in 16 weeks, um, I, think, I think that's pretty typical. But let's take a look at gabapentin. Um, we found 10 RCTs that matched our criteria of around 200 or around 2,500 patients. And again, that two to 16 week duration. Uh, I just broke down those trials and there was four that were looking at diabetic neuropathy, six that looked at post-herpetic neuralgia. So almost a 50-50 split. You'll see a really wide dose range in those studies from anywhere from 600 milligrams to the max dose of 3,600 milligrams and always versus a placebo. And so what did we find? Well, about 43% of patients that were given gabapentin had a meaningful improvement in their pain as compared to 25% on placebo. Um, and that gives us a number needed to treat of about six. You'll hear us say throughout the presentation, there were some um, interventions that were adverse events weren't really reported well. And that, that wasn't the case with anticonvulsants. We had a, a lot of data to go through to look at adverse events for anticonvulsants, and you'll see that there are many listed. Uh, dizziness, uh, somnolence and fatigue, those are the, the two more common with gabapentin. Um, also peripheral edema occurred more commonly uh, with gabapentin, and we just saw more withdrawals due to adverse events uh, in the intervention group in these trials, which wasn't super surprising. We also found a ton of RCTs for pregabalin, 27 in total, over 6,000 patients, similar time frame, and again, a really wide dosing range, anywhere from 150 milligrams to 600 milligrams, given as a daily dose and BID dosing. Um, and so numbers um, somewhat similar, 48% uh, of people with, that were given pregabalin found a meaningful improvement in pain versus 31% on placebo with a number needed to treat of seven. And again, the most common adverse events that we saw in these trials was dizziness with a number needed to harm of about eight, somnolence with a number needed to harm of 10. And once again, more people were withdrawing due to adverse events in the intervention groups. All right, so I guess I talk about oxcarbazepine and you might wonder why in the world this was included. Um, and actually some interesting discussions. Uh, our peer team has members from across Canada and so some members in different uh, 
um, provinces said, no, we sometimes see this being used. Um, and, and particularly because we were looking at tri, uh, trigeminal neuralgia, we were interested in carbamazepine, um, which we didn't find anything for, by the way, but uh, ox carbazepine was the, one of the ones that was included. So there was actually three randomized controlled trials uh, looking at this, um, and the daily dose range from 600 to 1800 milligrams. Um, and however, this was only patients with diabetic neuropathy. And so uh, actually one thing that we should say is, even though we wanted to find trials on trigeminal neuralgia, we actually found none. We did not find evidence for that, which is somewhat uh, disappointing because I, yeah, yeah I, well, probably lots of us have an interest in how in the world do we optimally manage that condition. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we did not find good evidence in the literature. However, for oxcarbazepine, uh, when we look at meaningful uh, improvement in pain, it was 43% uh, uh, versus 33%. It says pre in there, but I believe that's a oh. Uh, so, it but it was, yeah, the numbers weren't statistically significant. So it did not show a statistically significant benefit. And again, had uh, fairly impressive adverse events. And so these are some of the more common adverse events out of all the anticonvulsants. Similarly, we looked at topiramate. So topiramate, uh, there was only one randomized controlled trial that looked at this for uh, neuropathic pain. And again, it was with diabetic neuropathy. Um, 323 patients, followed them for 12 weeks. 400 milligrams daily versus placebo. And uh, this one did find a statistically significant improvement in pain with the number you just treat of eight. However, it's one trial. Um, and a similar, similar number of patients withdrew due, at, due to adverse events. Uh, so all of the anticonvulsants actually were uh, industry funded. We did not find any publicly funded trials looking at these interventions, which uh, would have been nice to find, but we did. not Yeah, so um, we like to, things into a bottom line for you. And so uh, what we had said is uh, if choosing anticonvulsant to treat neuropathic pain, that probably gabapentin or pregabalin are the best choices with the number needed to treat of around seven. But to remember that adverse events are high and the most common of those were dizziness and somnolence pretty consistently. Um, we like to represent uh, these findings in a visual format and we use icon arrays to look at uh, about hundred patients who would get better. And so the green guys and the yellow guys are the people that get better. Um, the yellow guys are the placebo response, which we standardized across the board for all of our interventions um, because they were pretty similar, but also to eat to, so it's easier to look at what may have a little bit more of an effect over placebo. Um, so for some interventions, the, placebo, the standardized placebo may have been a bit higher for some, a little lower, but still around the, the same range. And um, yeah, so when we're discussing different options with our patients, um, you'll see later that we have a way to compare all of our treatments across the board. We did feel that there wasn't uh, strong enough evidence to recommend topiramate with just that one RCT and that it did appear that the occurrence of adverse events with oxcarbazepine seemed to outweigh the benefits. And then um, just in case you're wondering, we took this information from the pricing doc, which I'll give you guys, a, I'll show you where you can find that um, later on in the presentation. Uh, so this would be a average or a 90 day um, price on these medications. Uh, one time dispensing interval is included in all those costs that are listed. But just to, to note that these are the dosing that, um, that was used to reference the pricing. And so that might be a little bit different than what you may dose in your practice. So if you are really trying to decide and you um, aren't sure cost-wise, you can always just pick up the phone and phone the pharmacist and they can estimate that for you. Yeah, awesome. All right. So let's talk about SNRIs. Um, so we found eight randomized controlled trials looking at these with uh, almost 3,000 patients, um, primarily looking again at diabetic neuropathy. It just seems to be that is one of the more commonly studied types of neuropathic pain. Uh, again, duration with the longest was 13 weeks, which we can just say is somewhat disappointing. It would be great to find trials that actually ran longer since this is actually a chronic condition. Um, and yeah, Jess, I haven't cured my patients either. So Okay, um, good. It's not just yeah. me. The so majority of these trials, again, looked at duloxetine. And if you were, um, you know, when we look at OA, when we look at low back pain, like duloxetine keeps showing up. So the, the makers of duloxetine have run a lot of trials uh, looking at this. There was one trial looking at venlafaxine and one at desvenlafaxine. Um, again, we found that the use of these uh, did demonstrate a statistically significant improvement in pain with a number needed to treat of about seven. And so that number needed to treat as above and beyond placebo. So 40% of patients in the placebo group got better. Um, and that was a bit higher in the treatment group here. 
So when we looked at the difference between agents, I mean, we didn't have a lot of data to, to pick from, but there was no significant difference. Again, these are all industry funded trials um, and the benefit was all seen at, at 12 weeks or, or after. So um, one thing I will say about SNRIs is this has come up with our pain um, guideline committee. They have a lot of questions about the uh, practical experience with SNRIs and concerns about the fact that all of these trials are industry funded. It would be lovely. In other data we've looked at, when we see trials that aren't industry funded, that benefit tends to be a little bit less. Uh, and so we've asked our committee actually uh, to vote on sort of ranking of duloxetine. Um, we started with oh, osteoarthritis and our committee is all over the place with regards to where they think it, it should be ranked based on um, some of the limitations in the data um, and the potential side effects that we see. So currently our team is looking at, uh, we're trying to pull all, all trials that have been registered but never published to see if there's any sort of publication bias or, or something else that's going on there. So there, so stay tuned, there will be more I think on this question and, and we'll see. Um, but it's fairly consistent with a lot of current guidelines that recommend it. Uh, so adverse events um, here, number needed to harm, you can see. So nausea, constipation, anorexia, diarrhea, vomiting, uh, somnolence. So it, it does have come with a fair number of adverse events. And the other thing that, that wasn't ever mentioned was that discontinuation. Um, would you ever discontinue it if you tried adverse events there too? Mm -hmm. All right, so bottom line is the evidence that we have suggests they can moderately decrease pain with an additional one in seven over placebo. Um, however, about one in seven will experience some type of adverse event, including nausea or withdrawal. Um, and so again, in this trial here, what you see is you see a fair number will benefit from placebo, a few additional will benefit from the treatment. And unfortunately, with and you'll see this consistently with a lot of the interventions, a fair number of patients will not receive benefit from these. Yeah. Those mad red faces are consistent with my practice <laughs> and chronic pain. I think <laughs> when you say mad red <laughs> Oh, it's so We're challenging. Sad. Yeah. Now just to move on to my favorite intervention. Just kidding, by the way. As I mentioned, I practice inner city medicine and I see firsthand every day the harms of opioids, but um we always look at them to say, you know, just want to make sure, is this a viable option? And so we found six randomized control trials, uh, about 1,149 patients with, and there was a combination of post-herpetic neuralgia and diabetic neuropathy. Um, mean age about 60, again, similar duration. And the breakdown of those studies was that three were looking at oxycodone, one was looking at tramadol, acetaminophen, one looked at tapentadol, and one for buprenorphine, which was kind of neat because we haven't seen um, very much buprenorphine in the other chronic pain work we've done. Interesting though, I said that we see no like morphine or extended release morphine, no um, hydromorphone products, which I know in Edmonton are, are very, very commonly prescribed. Um, obviously comparing to placebo. And so um, there was about 49% of the patients within the treatment arm had a meaningful pain relief versus 36% with placebo. That gives us a number needed to treat of around eight. Um, and then when you do look at, this is another one of those drugs that has a lot of withdrawal due to adverse events. Um, in this case, never needed to harm of 13, along with the, the somnolence, the nausea, the vomiting. I mean, these, it seems like these, these adverse events are just really consistent across the board with these drugs. And, and as it mirrors in practice, sometimes is the, is the treatment worth all of these different things that patients are experiencing? Um, it, yeah, it can be really, really changing. Um, I was saying that uh, acute, um, uh, uh, acute shingles is a condition where I will occasionally do, again, a short-term prescription for opioids, being very clear that that is, has an end date and everything, but I see, I see a lot of shingles in my practice, very, very painful. When I'm looking at the, the longer outcomes in the chronic pain, I'm not feeling like I'm missing out on anything that I rarely prescribe these for um, chronic pain management. And so we love, we love good Metagraph, you know, it wants to just squeeze one in there, it gives her a warm feeling inside. And so <laughs> this yeah, summer, thank you. yeah, you're welcome. It's really working on that Metagraph tattoo. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, this just summarizes all of our data and uh, brings us to a bottom line where it says it could be effective to reduce pain for about one in eight patients beyond placebo. 
but that these medications also have significant adverse events like somnolence, dizziness, constipation for about an additional one in seven and really limited evidence on the combination opioid um, products, the, the ones that just had a single RCT and then also the ones that had no RCTs as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay, so TCAs, this was another one. Um, and it depends which group you're talking to, but there are certain pockets of, of docs who say, well, yeah, I'm prescribing these all the time. And then others are saying, I don't prescribe them much. But we were really curious on their evidence for neuro neuropathic pain. Um, unfortunately, we only found two randomized control trials that reported responder analysis. It was a small number of patients and they followed them for only six to eight weeks. So the dosage and the doses ranged from 10 to 200 milligrams. So that's a bit of a range there for sure. Uh, and what if you look at these two and you put them, uh, you know, you met on combine their data, um, what they found a 78% improvement on TCA versus 26% with placebo. So number needed to treat of two. Um, <clears throat> however, we just had a, there's a lot of concerns with these two trials. Um, just the small size, the short duration. The funding was unclear, uh, pretty heterogeneous in their outcomes, and some some suggestion that they, they weren't randomizing patients as they should, questions around blinding and allocation concealment. Um, so we just we didn't feel comfortable, especially when we developed our knowledge translation tool, which we'll show you, putting these guys as the as the you know the winners of chronic pain management <laughs> um, based on this limited data. I mean, we had 40 trials on gabapentin alone. Um, and so what we did is we we went back and pulled, uh, so Cochrane did a, a similar systematic review on this a few years earlier, um, looking at TCAs and chronic neuropathic pain. And so we pulled, we, we looked at their data as well because they included all comers. Um, and they, what they included, they found was four randomized control trials with the number needed to treat of five. And then they reported ad adverse events. So withdrawal due to adverse events was 16% in the treatment group versus seven. Um, most commonly was some dry mouth and I think dizziness in there as well. So the, the bottom line with regards to TCAs is that they, they may provide benefit. Um, however, it's just really disappointing that the uh, quality of studies was low. And we were just joking yet earlier today, we were talking about vitamin D. And, you know, if you look at vitamin D in uh, PubMed, you'll find literally hundreds of thousands of trials. Um, but when we want to look at something like TCAs, we find, you know, two, maybe four. It's, it's pretty disappointing, um, <clears throat> but that's the data we have. So if you believed that data, it's low quality, but if you believed it, it does actually show one of the more significant benefits with regards to pain management. Yeah. And even like being in the meetings with our group when we're, as these things are coming out, we're going, what? You found how many? No, that can't be real. No, we should double check that. And it just goes back and forth because you, you've got to think there must be more trials looking at this. And it's really disappointing. Um, moving on, something a little less disappointing group of patients, which I have to be honest, when I think of like, when I'm like doing a history and I'm looking for neuropathic pain, I'm like, is there burning or tingling? Then I'm like, should we put this burny cream on it? Like, I, I don't know. It wasn't something that I really started using, but um, look at this, like 10 RCTs over 2,000 patients. It's like actually 52 weeks. That was kind of promising. Like there's actually a year follow-up. Um, one thing that varied within this was uh, different uh, modes of, 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 of capsaicin. So there was capsaicin cream. There was also patches um, versus like placebo patches, placebo creams, or the, sometimes for a placebo, they'd use like a very, very mild capsaicin alternative. Um, but what they did find was that about 49% of, or what we found, I guess, whatever. 49% of people in this, in that were using rubifacients in some form uh, seem to have a meaningful improvement in pain versus 34% of control or placebo with a number needed to treat of seven. Um, broken down into, uh, again, we just need to say nothing for trigeminal neuralgia, but for diabetic neuropathy and post neuralgia neuralgia um, was split down the middle. It, it, you're probably, you might be like me going, okay, you got four and four, but you said there was 10. That's because we had some of these that would have multiple interventions. So they kind of get split up a little bit, but um, you could say that the, the number needed to treat for diabetic neuropathy was a little bit better than that for post neuropathic neuralgia, but again, pretty like similar to some of the um, other pharmacotherapy that we looked at. Um, and then I, for adverse events, they always want to say heat sensation, which I don't know, like maybe someone needs to explain this to me, but I thought it was supposed to feel warm. So when I get, it, I guess it would maybe be if it was like uncomfortably warm or, or if you said you didn't like it, um, that that's a common 
uh, adverse event, obviously, with a number needs to harm of anywhere between three and six. Obviously, like local erythema, if it was significant, maybe you wouldn't want that on your Bowie spot. Um, but we did say as a bottom line that rubifacients appear to be an effective option for neuropathic pain and that they should be counseled regarding local effects. So yeah, maybe warn someone if you're gonna give them like a spicy cream <laughs> that, it's, that it's coming in hot. But um, if they were to benefit from that, that might be um, something that could be helpful. Um, and acupuncture, gotta throw in this cute little wool, woolly mammoth. Again, another thing that I probably, I mean, I don't have patients that can afford acupuncture that we do have acupuncture that comes volunteer to our clinic when it's not, COVID times. Um, and I probably wouldn't think to tell them to go, but let's see what we found. Um, I found this really interesting. Maybe you will too, maybe not. Maybe there's a few of you that will. We found three RCTs, about 250 patients. That's not too, too impressive. Again, outcomes, eight to 10 weeks. Uh, two of them looked at diabetic neuropathy, two at post neuralgia. But this is what was hilarious to me is like how we can even try to compare this. These are the three trials we found. One was standardized acupuncture versus sham acupuncture. And I talked a little bit about sham. I didn't know I was so interested in acupuncture until like maybe a week ago. But, but sham is where they have this standardized little tool where the patient can't really tell if the needle goes in. So like a really good form of a control if you're looking at this type of intervention. Then there was auricular or like ear acupuncture versus a sham TENS machine. I don't know. I think I like I would probably hopefully know which one of those I was getting. And then the last was electroacupuncture versus a brochure. So just to show you like how things can be so, so, so different. Um, but trying to put those together to say, OK, could this benefit our patients? Uh, womp womp. You'll see that the number needed to treat was not statistically significant with about 22 percent in the acupuncture group um, having that meaningful improvement versus 13 percent in control. But gosh, did we try? Um, <laughs> And who knows, um, I guess you'd have to look at the harms if, if you thought that would be a thing. But really, we've said at this point that, um, another metagraph for you there, Tina, but the, the, that the evidence doesn't seem to support acupuncture for neuromancy pain. All right, so, um, you know, unfortunately, because for low back pain, we found a lot of evidence for exercise and exercise was sort of the winner of management. Um, when we looked at neuropathic pain, we actually found no RCTs with responder analysis for neuropathic pain. So it was, it was kind of disappointing. Um, and um, I'll just say at the bottom, so that's one of the questions our committee has put forward is, um, can you just look if there's any evidence for exercise of neuropathic pain? Because um, wouldn't that be a, nice if that could be an overarching recommendation? It may, it may not be though. Um, and similarly for top, other topicals, so things like lidocaine, we just didn't find any evidence for. Uh, so currently, these are some of the areas that the committee has decided that should be investigated a little bit further. So looking at exercise for neuropathic pain, um, looking at topicals, looking at updating cannabis. So we do have a, a guideline that we wrote in 2018, um, but there's just always lots of questions around that. What is evidence? Is there anything new? So um, we're certainly looking at that. Uh, and TCAs, like I talked about, we, we have a little bit of evidence for it, but looking at in a more broad context um, and also the evidence around TCAs for the other interventions like back pain, which we didn't find previously. And then similarly counseling and other strategies or things that are still being investigated. Um, so we'll have a bit more information when we, when we do the guidelines. All right, so this is, um, yeah, like Jess says, I love metagraphs and tables. So this just summarizes everything. It's a bit overwhelming, um, but uh, a couple of things I like. So on the left-hand side, it just tells you all the interventions that where we found some level of evidence, um, the certainty of evidence. Uh, so really anticonvulsants and SNRIs had the best quality of evidence that we could identify, even though it was all industry funded. Often industry does really good trials. They do large trials, they check all the right boxes. Um, so if you're just looking from that point of view, they're reasonable. The number of RCTs that we identified and then the event rates uh, with how many responders. Uh, so this is just listing risk ratios and then calculated numbers needed to treat. Uh, so if we take that and then move to the next page. So this is uh, sort of our simplified decision aid. Um, actually, one of my favorite things about this tool is it's really the title where it says how many people will have their pain meaningfully improve, which is about 30%. So it's just sort of setting the stage for patients as in we're not, we're, it's unlikely that we're gonna cure this problem. And we're really just looking at, is there any way we can give you an improvement in the pain that you currently have? Um, 
And so things, and again, it's tricky. This is probably the worst body of literature that we came across in all of the reviews that we did. And so we decided to sort of rank them by certainty of evidence. So the certainty of evidence moderate. So these two guys at the top have moderate level of evidence and you can see um, the potential benefit. Uh, in the middle, the evidence is low, um, but it's the best that we have. And then at the bottom is the very low quality of evidence. But if you looked at ones um, that seem to have the best evidence, I mean, the best uh, effect, TCAs would be it. So um, just a tool, and those are, that's really the main ones we found when we looked at neuropathic pain. So trying to set the stage. And again, it's really impressive, I think, just how many patients benefit from placebo in those interventions. Mm -hmm. And so on the other mm -hmm. side of that one pager is this piece of information um, where it was sort of, it was ranked by uh, the committee, benefits likely exceed harms, benefits may not exceed harms, um, no evidence of benefit, harms may exceed benefits, and unclear. And so that's that's the initial uh, approach to that. Like I said, our guideline committee will be looking at that and some of those may change a bit um, as we round out the data a little bit, um, but it's a good start. And then it also gives you just evidence around withdrawals because that's that risk benefit uh, ratio. So adverse events, what are some of the adverse events that you may experience and then cost, which we think would be super relevant to a lot of patients as well. And for prescribing comments, it's often related to, so for instance, pregabalin, we're just telling you what the doses were in the trials. So if we're basing our evidence, our medicine practices off of best evidence, this is the evidence that we have. And these are the, the doses that were being used in those studies. Um, uh, so generally that's it, if we have any other small notes to add. Yeah, and then another way that we've taken this information and tried to turn it into a way to um, inform shared informed decision making with your patients is through our pain calculator. That address there. This is what it looks like when you pull it up on your browser and it also um, conforms to your phone or as a like almost like a mobile app that you could use with patients, not an actual app, but a mobile app. So learned about what the difference between those was recently when I was searching for an app that I couldn't find. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I don't know what it looks like on a tablet because if I had a tablet in my clinic, it would grow legs real fast, but, um, but yeah, you can check that out. And so, uh, oh, here, I guess I'll just go back really quick. So uh, you'll see that it's split up into neuropathic pain, osteoarthritis pain, and back pain. And then if you go into each category, um, there's a drop down menu that again, compares all the treatments, uh, things that I like, um, when I'm using this with patients is this is actually interactive. So I can say, where's your pain? And I can drag this little guy across the bar to where they say their pain is. Again, most of my patients are right up here at the 10. Um, and then we can look at all of those things compared to one another, but we can also take a look, a closer look at each intervention. So they say, oh, gabapentin, like I wanna know a little bit more about that. So then if you click on gabapentin, again, you can move around where their pain is on um, this scale here. Uh, just another like a pie chart to kind of look at who's going to improve, who wouldn't, and then a bit of talk about harms. Um, I can't scroll down, but there's a little bit more at the bottom. You can also then link into actual, like I, I don't have any patients that would be interested in this, but you can go into the actual evidence in terms of the stuff that we talked about tonight. So what was the study dose range, how long were the studies, and, and different things like that if you really want to go in deep. Um, and then we list the cost at the bottom. Uh, down there, it's listed as a, a daily cost. Um, so that wouldn't include pharmacy dispensing fees, which for some medications is really significant, especially depending how often you want them dispensed. So another way to look at that is the pricing doc that I talked about before, which you can find at pricingdoc.acfp.ca. And I just found it today, actually. <laughs> you can search individual drugs in the bar there. That was cute. Um, but yeah, you can look up classes, you can look up um, uh, individual drugs, and you can find a 90-day price estimate that does include uh, a dispensing interval as well. And what I really like about this is it tells us if this is um, Alberta Blue Cross, if it's covered by Alberta Blue Cross, if it's covered by NIHB for our Indigenous patients. And that is really helpful because previously I was looking up on all these different places, um, which was just a bit more time consuming. So this is actually updated monthly, um, though it says 2020. And then once a year, they just kind of announce that it's updated. But um, but yeah, you're not looking at old prices here. So that's really reassuring. Mm -hmm. 
And so, yeah, we cruised along. Uh, we thought we might finish even later today, but we've left lots of time for questions because I know we had a really interactive bunch last week. And um, I don't know if you had any final thoughts, Tina, or if we just want to move right into questions or if you've been already peeking ahead. Yeah, I was thinking ahead a little oh. bit. Um, yeah, the only thing I would say that is somewhat interesting, um, because we limited our data to responder analysis, you might say, oh, did you miss a ton of, of data? But um, actually, the conclusions we came to when you look at other systematic reviews that have looked at scale changes are actually fairly consistent, which is somewhat reassuring, I would say. Um, so a lot of the current reviews will say the same thing. So your pre gab your pregabalin, your gabapentin, duloxetine are the ones that, based on the available evidence, consistently seem to show uh, best level of evidence. Yeah, and Daphne, I just saw that you raised your hand and this happened once last week. If you do have a question, I think we get you to type it because I have no idea how to unmute you or actually <laughs> interact with you. But if maybe if you're having any issues to pop it in the chat or, um, or Carrie or I guess I could help out too. Um, yeah, okay, so we've got a few questions here about TCAs. Yeah, so I can start with that because yeah. I was just reviewing when I saw those questions. So, uh, so uh, Tina's question, great name, by the way, but um, it was about what was the age in the trials? And I thought she meant what was the age of the trials? So I, because I was like, yeah, exactly. The, like the trials are kind of old. So they were a couple from the 80s and 90s. Um, but then I realized she meant the age of the people. So when I went back and looked, actually, the data we've compiled and the trials we looked at, the age was not reported conveniently. So that would be nice oh. to put, but they didn't report up actual age um, of those. So yeah, it's, it's so unfortunate. So could we parse out number data to harm an elderly? Uh, not really. Uh, and then the yeah. second question was that, uh, so for the TCA number needed to treat, was that specific to post herpetic ne neuralgia or diabetic neuropathy? Um, and I'll give you, sure two kind of answers to that. So the two um, studies that we identified that give you a number needed to treat of two, one was diabetic and one was post-herpetic conveniently. Um, in the Cochrane review, there was four and those four that we, so we, um, we pulled those four out and those again, there was a couple that were uh, uh, post-herpetic. I think there was two. Yeah. yeah. And then the diabetic, and then we also included a mixed uh, neuralgia in, in that as well. Yeah. So yeah, a bit of a smattering there, though it would be certainly nice to see more volume for sure. Um, Eleanor has a great question uh, in terms of in palliative care, we have success with methadone for neuropathic pain. Is there any, any evidence in chronic pain? Now, my understanding when we, did we include methadone when we searched for opioids, Tina, do you recall? I know we obviously included buprenorphine because we found a trial for bup. Yeah, I... I can find out if we want to take not, a minute. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I want to say, um, I want to say that we didn't find trials with, with what we were looking for, but oh, Oh no, there's Drake again. Welcome back, Drake. You had such great thought-provoking commentary last time too. So I'm glad you're back. Um, okay, I'm gonna take one second to try to look into if we included methadone in our search. Tina, can you see the questions or no? Yeah, I'm just looking at, yeah. Oh, Actually, okay, Tina, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a question that got put in the chat and I'll ask that. Oh. And uh, also it comes with, with the Drake's, if a patient has chronic neuropathic pain in addition to mental health disorders like depression, anxiety, would it be better to prescribe SNRIs, TCA, even though gabapentin, pregabalin evidence is better? And, you know, it leads to that question that these patients are complex. And in the trials you're looking at, you know, do they eliminate people, with, you know, other comorbidities or how do they how, how do you determine that? And so, and then we'll go on to Drake's after you guys can read that. Yeah, so that, so, and that was, um, yeah, part of the discussion with our guideline committee when we're thinking of SNRIs and, and TCAs, um, because absolutely, and I think that's what we're in sort of as primary care practitioners, we do really well is looking at kind of, uh, if you can get a couple of wins, maybe that's a reasonable intervention. and and how much, right, and it's so complex, how much of those mood symptoms are contributing to a worsening of the, of the pain. 
um, which is which is another question we had looked at answering, but we just had to draw the line somewhere. So that one isn't being included. But um, I would say absolutely. In certain cases where a patient may get a benefit, uh, a twofer, I, that would be a very reasonable place to go first. Um, and even though we said there's there's certainly a significantly more trials looking at gabapentin and pregabalin, but the numbers needed to treat, which I think yeah, Jess has up here still, um, I mean, really seven, eight, ten, I mean, they're, they're similar, right? That's not like we're looking at numbers needed to treat of 75 or 100, which are some of the numbers needed to treat we see for some of our preventative interventions and things like that. So. Great. And then I, I think you can see the Drake's question there. Was there any non-medicinal therapies that were also suggested for neuropathic pain? Uh, thinking of patients that are on medications to help with their pain, what else could add to their pain management picture? So some of the, you know, physio, uh, great motor imagery. Um, the next step is exercise and looking at, at other therapies. So I, I can start on that, Justin. So sure. we... Pick it up. Um, yeah, when we specifically determined when we were looking at this, we were going to look at um, sort of medical interventions at, at this point. Uh, um, so as in sort of complementary medicines, we didn't really look at that, say, although we are looking at cannabis, I guess, I don't know where you'd, create, you'd put that. So the physio will be included in the exercise piece for sure. And then we will be looking at psychological interventions. Okay. Uh, that's another big question that actually Jess is tackling. So that's going to be, uh, it's, it's a lot of work, but um, we'll certainly be looking at that. But you're right. And the trouble, part of the trouble with this is there's just so many potential interventions. So, and it's, and you can see even the well-known interventions that we have, the evidence isn't great. So to go off into looking at, at all of them would be impossible for us. So we're trying to pick at least give us a baseline information of some of the commonly used uh, interventions, just to give people an idea of what the benefit and risks are. Yeah, and I would just echo what Tina said about how of the three systematic reviews we've done, this one was the one that had the most challenging evidence. And I'm finding that even within just looking at the psychological interventions um, the, in the searches we've been doing, we've found a bunch of distant, different systematic reviews looking at chronic low back pain, a bunch looking at osteoarthritis. And our first big search was, was we were completely empty handed when it came to neuropathic pain and talking about things like CBT and ACT and, and all of that. Um, I, I'm, we've dug deeper and we're finding more now. So as of last week, I was, I was feeling less hopeful and, and you found me at a good <laughs> part of my roller coaster of emotions today because I finally like hit a bit of a jackpot though. Yeah, I always get really hopeful. And then I start to look into it closer and it's it, it comes back down to these standardized mean difference. And you don't even you can't even really interpret what they're talking about or or even find like a baseline in terms of where your patient started to say where you think it would take them or or again this idea of like who actually responds. So whatever. I'm always hopeful and then I and then <laughs> then I fall apart. But um hoping to look into that a bit more, that's for sure. Um I'm finding, like, I'm wanting to look up answers, but when I'm screen sharing, I can't go, I can't get away from this. So I don't know if we want to, yeah, I don't know if Tina, if you have one that you can look at, I haven't heard back on the methadone thing. I know where I could find it, but I just don't know. How to... Yeah, so, well, so the question that's sitting in front of me is this, uh, the dosing, right? So with regards to gabapentin or SNRIs, how many patients? So that's a really important question. I mean, do we need to, yeah, if you want to see that benefit, do you need to get everyone up to 3,600 milligrams a day, or will you see evidence of benefit um, at a lower intervention? And so I'm just, you know, just like 40 trials, I'm just sort of screening, uh, scanning through here. Um, but it, yeah, it really is, was a bit all over the place, up to 3,600, some sort of gabapentin, 1,200. I, think, I find even within the trials, it, it can be challenging because lots of times they won't even, they'll give you a dose range. And then when you're trying to look deeper to find out, okay, but how many people were on 300 BID versus 1200 TID, that sometimes isn't even, yeah, they don't right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I and think, it, yeah, I was going to say, and it must uh, affect them, number needed to harm. So 
if you, you slap someone on 900 three times a day of gabapentin, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's no wonder they, they, they leave that study. So it, yeah, it's curious. Um, that was one of my questions, but <laughs> I butt in there. <laughs> no yeah. problem. Um, oh, go ahead, Tina. I was just going to say the general principle is we say it's just start low because like, just as Kathy alluded to, um, you're going to minimize side effects and hopefully maximize effect. And then as you increase, that additional benefit is going to be just tiny compared to the additional adverse events that you're going to see. Um, and so, yeah, when you look at the, the gabapentin trials generally seem to be about 1200 to 3600. Um, interestingly, the TCA trials, I'll just say that one was amitriptyline 10, um, which is kind of my favorite dose, actually, just like a super low dose. Uh, sometimes I have patients who want half of that, which is, I find kind of fun. But um, so, yeah, it, it is interesting because a lot of trials, they, they won't start super low because they're so interested in showing a benefit, but really we could, we can start low and there's no harm in, in, in starting that way. Yeah, great. And uh, we have a question here about nerve blocks, the rhizotomies, and, uh, and other sort of procedural stuff that often gets recommended. Uh, any evidence for that or did you have, is that another whole systematic review? Yeah, so we did talk, I, I, it was always a really fascinating thing to be a part of, like just learning how this comes together. And we start out with this like massive list and then we have to like be realistic. And so we try to look at things that physicians could provide in the office or could do without a, a need for a referral. That being said, I know that we did look at corticosteroid injections in um, low back pain, which we talked about last week, but we kind of came to that conclusion by saying, well, we can often refer pretty easily to um, horoscopic guided things, but when it comes to like rhizotomies and nerve blocks, so those aren't something that would be a first line intervention. And, and so ultimately long answer, uh, but Gary, we didn't look at, at those interventions for neuropathic pain. Okay, great. Any more questions? I, I have a, another question being a recently semi-retired doctor, how did we all get taught to use Tegretol for trigeminal neuralgia if there is no evidence for it? Or that blows me away. Is it, it, is it the responder sort of uh, lens that you were looking at, but how did all that happen? <laughs> yeah, it's a super good question. You know, it may be, and I, so we didn't search beyond that. So like you have to think there's something, right? Because I even was looking that up again today, but yeah, the recommendations are that's what you should use um, even now as a suggestion, but where does that evidence come from? I, we haven't looked, so it must be just a, a, a different quality of evidence. I'm hoping, I mean, I hope we didn't just make that up, but there has to be something, but it's a very good question. Um, and, and maybe something we will look into further um, because yeah, it's pretty fascinating. We didn't find anything, anything here. Yeah, it, it's interesting. And were there any primary care sort of pragmatic trials with real family doc patients that have multiple comorbidities? Did you run into that at all? Wouldn't that well, be whenever, well, that's exactly what we would need. We do always, when we do our data extraction, we always check if they're um, where the, they're located, if they're located in primary care and specialty care. But I don't actually have that on hand, but I will say for any of the topics that I've reviewed, like by and large, the vast majority is in specialty care. And again, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if we had these pragmatic trials that reflected the patients that we see in our practice, right? Yeah, exactly. And so that's sort of a shout out to the pragmatic trial part of PEER and uh, bed med and, and some other um, other things that I think as family docs and as community practitioners and, you know, working in medical teams and are in medical homes and medical neighborhood that sometimes we need to create our own evidence to find out what really works. And so uh, just a shout out to, to the people that are doing that. And I know it's hard to do because we don't get a lot of funding for that, <laughs> but uh, really appreciate uh, the time and uh, answering all those questions and taking a look at the evidence.